Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of The Casual Criminalist. This one is one of our short episodes where we look at a crime that is less long and usually less brutal. This one is Mass Salaman, Singapore's biggest ever manhunt. You know, when I first started considering doing this podcast, it was so brutal. I found myself like, <laughs> you'd read, I'd spend like an hour describing these horrific, brutal crimes that afterwards I'd, you know, go read like wholesome memes on Reddit or something for a while. I was trying to think how I could make this, this show, this podcast, if you're listening to it or YouTube channel, if you're watching it on YouTube, I was like, how can I make this a bit lighter? And I was thinking, Tell me what you think of this. We we'll just do Florida Man segments, <laughs> where instead, you know, after an extremely brutal one, we'd have a, a Florida Man. You know, a crime committed by a Florida Man, which would be ridiculous and and funny and way less horrific. Let me know what you think of that. I, I didn't do it because I eventually came around to the thought that it was a terrible idea. So anyway, let's move on. This is Mass Salamat, Singapore's biggest ever. Manhunt. What happens here if you're new? Well, first of all, welcome. Uh, Callum will write me a script. I will read the script and occasionally I might throw in my own thoughts if I feel that they are warranted, even if you feel they are not. Anyway, let's carry on. A good jailbreak story is easy to get caught up in. Oh my god. Oh wait, no, I'm thinking of a heist. <laughs> I love Ocean's Eleven so much. I've seen that movie so many. I saw that movie in the cinema twice because I just loved it. A good jailbreak story is easy to get caught up in. Whether it's a real-world escape like the drug lord El Chapo's underground motorbike getaway in 2015 or Andy Dufresne crawling out of a sewage pipe in the Shawshank Redemption, there is another incredible movie. There's something about them that really captures the imagination. That's the kind of story I've got for you today. By the way, I recently re-watched the first season of Prison Break, which, you know, I'm going to assume you've seen because it was a huge show in 2005, 2000. First year of university, Prison Break was all the rage. And I remember thinking it was brilliant. And me and my friends, we loved watching it. And I watched that recently, maybe last year. TV got really a lot better in the last 15 years. And Prison Break, it was good. It was enjoyable. Uh, my wife, who'd never seen it before, she was like, Simon, this this isn't Breaking Bad, is it? And I'm like, no, it's not. You're goddamn right. That's the kind of story I've got for you today, but before we get too ahead of ourselves, let me point out that you're not going to be able to get behind the main character of this unlikely escape. Oh, no. At no point was his life narrated by Morgan Freeman. And on top of that, he belonged to one of Asia's most notorious terrorist organizations. Oh, that's a shame. It's always nice where it's like, you know, the guy breaking out of prison, you're like, yeah, go, come on. And it's like, the reality is most of the people who break out of prison are people who really deserved to be in prison and are probably in prison for a long time because you don't break out of prison if you're doing like a six month stretch. You're like, I'll just do it. Because if you break out of prison, they're putting you back in there for longer than six months. I've seen TV shows. I know that this is true. That's how today's criminal mastermind found himself rotting in a jail cell in Singapore, a place among the most secure and strict countries on earth. So how in the hell did one of its most notorious criminals manage to break out of one of its most famously secure prisons? Well, I can tell you now that the answer is surprisingly ridiculous. Without giving anything else away, let's dive right into the story of Mass Salamat, Asia's most wanted man. The Capture. First, a little bit of background information. Everyone knows Al-Qaeda. Everyone knows the Taliban. But few outside of Southeast Asia will be familiar with G. Jamar Islamaya. I apologize. <laughs> I realize I don't even know what language they speak in Singapore. So whatever language that is, I apologize for not being able to pronounce it properly. In short, they're basically an Al-Qaeda-adjacent group of radicals who dream of setting up their own caliphate across Asia, what's now commonly known as doing an ISIS. <laughs> Joking aside, these eyes really had no, were no laughing matter, and they were responsible for some terrible bombings in Bali in 2002. I remember those in the news, and they reportedly had some even bigger plays in the pipe uh, throughout the years that followed. And that's where old Mass comes in. Born in Java, Indonesia in 1961, his family moved to Singapore during his early years. By his late 20s, he was heavily involved with terrorist figures in the region, and in the mid-90s, his aptitude for terribleness saw him promoted to head of operations in Singapore. To prepare, he it sounds so formal. Congratulations, you're now head of operations of a terrorist cell. 
To prepare, he went off to Afghanistan for several years to get his PhD in being a total bastard and a diploma in bomb making alongside. I'm guessing he didn't really get a PhD in Afghanistan. Probably not. A few years after his return to Singapore, a certain definitive event in US history occurred. Gonna guess that that's Pearl 9-11 which caused a ramping up of security efforts around the world. With the heat piling on, Mas Salamat decided to up sticks and leave Singapore for Malaysia with his wife and kids before seeing a good chunk of his terror cell arrested. It's a good thing authorities cracked down when they did, as Mas had been in discussions with the head of, is it, I don't know if it's GI or Jul, I'm just gonna say GI, the, the terrorist organization, it's like a J and then either an L or a capital I. Also, what's with English? Why does the lowercase L have to look like a capital I? It's ridiculous, and it makes my job difficult. Uh, about his plans to A, hijack a plane and crash it into Changi Airport, B, blow up a bunch of trucks simultaneously around town, and C, overthrow the entire Singaporean government itself. Whoa, dude, number C is way more intense. <laughs> so yeah, I gotta crash a plane into an airport, you know, do some regular old terrorism. Or, or, alternatively, overthrow the government. But despite all that awful potential, it was something extremely simple which eventually led to his arrest. A fake ID. Yep, the evil plots of Singapore's most notorious terrorist leader were undone by the same flaw as your attempts to get into Weatherspoons when you were 15. In 2003, he was arrested in Indonesia for using a fake Indonesian passport and jailed for a year and a half. Unfortunately, he was allowed to walk free after that because Singapore and Indonesia didn't have an extradition treaty at the time. <laughs> I always wonder, like, extradition treaties, it, it, where the, the fact that there are non-extradition countries where they just haven't signed an agreement, and I'm, I don't know if these countries don't get along, I don't know a lot about the politics of Indonesia and Singapore, surprisingly, but it is slightly strange that they're, like, basically neighbors, and they're like, no, 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 you, you can't have the criminals that ran off to our country. Why? Get it together. Never mind that, though, because in 2006 he made the exact same mistake in Java and was handed over to the Singaporean authorities. Good, but he should have got handed over three years earlier. Come on. Now, I don't know how you feel about anti-terror legislation. Generally, pretty good. I mean, obviously, I'm answering Callum's question myself. I know it was rhetorical. I apologize. Uh, Jerry, I feel pretty good about it. There is some, like, invasion of privacy stuff that's maybe a bit too far. Like, after all those Edward Snowden leaks, and it's like, oh... The government's spying on everyone all the time. I mean, that was a bit intense. But generally, I'm like, well, I don't know. I'm not really doing any terrorism, so I'm probably okay. Now, I don't know how you feel about anti-terror legislation, but Singapore is Singapore's is some of the most draconian in the world. Doesn't surprise me. Isn't Singapore the country where gum chewing gum is illegal because reasons? That meant that the counter-terrorist police could detain Mr. Salamat indefinitely without trial or even any official charges. Now, that is that should not be allowed, guys. I think in the UK, if I remember correctly, and I'm not sure if they've changed this now, but it was 30 days you could be held without charge if they suspected you of terrorism, which I thought was pretty extreme, like, to not, you know, not pursue a charge after 30 days is... Yeah, that's long. You could debate the moral morality of that in your own time. Thanks, Callum. <laughs> I think we just did. But for now, all we have to know is that Mass was safely locked away and not scheduled for release anytime soon. So in Singapore, I know, I, I know, Callum doesn't want us to debate the morality of this. But doesn't that mean there's what? I mean, what's the point of the courts? Where it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that guy could just be held without charge forever. If we take him to court, it's going to be worse because then he might go free. The escape. Okay, so that's the prelude done. Here's the meaty part. The escape. Obviously, you saw it coming because, well, I told you it was coming. You did, Callum. But you have to ask, why didn't the Singaporean guards foresee it? I say that because Mass was no stranger to escape attempts. During that 18-month stint in Indonesia, he carried out two of them. Isn't there that French guy who's, like, in prison for, like, uh, cool heists or something? I don't want to say cool heists, but, I mean... Like, when you're in jail for terror, I'm like, I hope you never break out. But if you're like an international cat burglar, jewel thief, I'm like, you break out of prison, I'm like, respect. Especially if it's cool. And I think this guy, he broke out of helicopters, uh, broke out of prison like three times with helicopters. I, I, I mean, I have no idea like the details of this, so I'm just going to stop. But it was pretty cool.
The second involved a pretty daring jump from a window ledge, which resulted in a shattered leg, bone and, per bone and permanent limp. I never said he had a particularly successful track record. The injuries meant he'd be playing as an ex-escapes on hard mode. Or so he thought. In truth, he was probably surprised with just how easy it turned out to be. On the 27th of February 2008, at around 4pm, the guards at Whitley Road Detention Center let Mass Salmat out of his cell for family visitation. His wife and kids were coming, and the prisoner was allowed to change into his regular clothes to meet them. I mean, I get family visits. I know. It's, isn't this guy going to go to prison forever? Do it. Why does it? I, okay, no, I can't argue against family visits. I'm like, he should be able to see his kids, even if he's a horrific terrorist. I'm not that cold-hearted. Hey, I don't know. Am I? He's a horrible terrorist. He planned to kill many people. The guards took him to the bathroom to prepare, and one waited outside the stall. Around ten minutes passed, and Mass was taking a while to finish his business. The water was still running, and the guard could see his legs when he looked under the stall. So he gave a knock on the door and told Mass to wrap it up. I don't feel like you should let this dude out of your sight. I mean, do, do stalls in prison, do they have doors on them? Surely, I mean, I've seen prison cells in like movies. There's just the shitter in the room with you. And if, if you're sharing a cell with someone, I guess you just like, look away, I'm taking a shit. And the guy's like, I know, I know you're taking a shit. I can smell it. We're in a tiny room. But nothing happened. Another few minutes passed before the guards forced open the toilet door to find an empty store with just a pair of trousers hanging from the door. Mass Salamat was nowhere to be found. Okay, that was pretty brief. Hardly an epic prison break tale. But let's rewind a little bit to find out exactly what happened on the other end of the toilet door. How did the magnificent Mass Salamat pull off his disappearing act? Also, how did the how did the guards be like, well, we saw his legs, we knocked on the door, he didn't reply, so we waited a few more minutes? What's wrong with you? Well, after hanging his trousers on the door to buy himself a few extra minutes, he climbed on top of the toilet and wriggled out of a narrow window. It's not like he had to spend weeks sawing off the window bars or anything like that, because there weren't any. It was just a regular old window which anyone could have opened. <laughs> Singapore's most secure prison. After that, it was a short limp through the prison yard under the absent gaze of the armed guards and unattended CCTV cameras. I'm going to repeat, Singapore's most secure prison. <laughs> to the feeble premise offense, Singapore's most secure prison. I'm going to stop, but it's like, really? Uh, he scrambled over the fence before making off into the city. All in all, there, were just, as, there was just an 11-minute window between mass entering the toilet and the guards breaking down the door, after which he was long gone. I guess, like, what's a regular prison in Singapore like? Just a field? And it's just they trust the prisoners to stay in the field? It's ridiculous. Season 1 of Prison Break would have been really short and i should also say like say like seasons three and five or because they could break out of prison like three times and then there's the new season last year or whatever and he's breaking out of prison again it's like what is going on <laughs> the hunt of course a massive manhunt oh this is actually about the hunt this isn't about the break this is singapore's biggest manhunt it's not about the escape from prison it's about the hunt of course, a massive manhunt was launched instantly. The government didn't release any statements straight after the event itself, so the public only found out about four hours later. But the police were on high alert. Maybe the authorities were hoping to spare themselves the embarrassment by catching on mass just a few blocks from the prison before anyone noticed. I mean, surely he couldn't have limped very far. But no such luck, he really did seem to have disappeared. The main phase of the search began, which would turn out to be the most expensive in the country's history, roping in police agencies from around the region. Images of the escapee were sent to millions of citizens' phones, the same images which were plastered on posters every five meters around the city. Singaporeans were even encouraged to lock up their bicycles so public enemy number one couldn't BMX his way to freedom. <laughs> Singapore, I, I do wonder about you. I mean, you seem to be extremely draconian, in many ways extremely competent, but also not very competent at law enforcement at the same time. Now, if you're a fan of the show, you'll know that we're a little ambivalent towards that kind of mass media frenzy. Our skepticism really bears out in this story, because the tip lines were flooded with thousands of responses all claiming they'd spotted Mass Salamat around Singapore. If they'd all been correct, then Mass must have picked up the ancient art of teleportation alongside his studies in terror. But a boom boom. The torrent of information potentially did more harm than good. So, as the days went by and turned into weeks, then months, he's gone. He's gone. He's, he's not in Singapore anymore. I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Because Singapore's a city. Like, you gotta leave. You gotta get out. Go to one of those non-extradition countries. If you're, if you're new here, uh, I'm guessing, I don't know this story, I don't read these scripts ahead of time, this is as much a surprise to me as it is to you. 
Uh, he's, he's gone. He's gone. Uh, surely the only expl explanation for Mass's total disappearance was that he had died during the getaway or been picked up by his allies, people thought. They swapped third-hand stories from friends of friends who swore his body had been found in a patch of woodland or that he had escaped to Indonesia on a speedboat. School kids even adopted old Mass as an urban legend for a while, saying the creepy terrorist leader would approach young ones to ask for their help. Don't laugh it off so easily. I still remember the time Bin Laden waited outside my school to ask if I could help him escape pa to Pakistan. Those were a crazy few months. <laughs> yeah, the old Bin Laden urban legends. What a classic. But never mind all that. With the magic of retrospection, I can show you exactly how wrong all of this wild speculation turned out to be. See, Mass was very much alive and well. After squeezing out of that window and strolling to freedom, Mass had made his way to the Pan Island Expressway, where he hid out under a bridge for five days. Hardly as glamorous as a speedboat getaway. He survived off little cubes of butter which he had stowed away and accumulated over the month prior without the guards noticing. Now, I know how people typically smuggle stuff in and out of prison, and how the hell does that work with butter? It's not an image we're going to be dwelling on for very long. Oh, no, I'm going to dwell. He's been that butter up his bum. Um, I guess butter's actually quite a smart thing to take because it's relatively compact. I guess it... Oh, maybe it comes in like a little plastic thing that you open or something? I don't know. In my mind, it's always wrapped in little bits of tin foil, which is... Good, good. Let's stop dwelling on this. Callum was what right? Why am I dwelling on it? Anyway, this tactic got him through. The, oh, but what I was going to say is butter's quite a good thing to use. It's very calorie dense. It's very small. It's quite convenient. I mean, it doesn't taste great. I mean, it does in the right situation. But like eating it under a bridge <laughs> for its calorie content, it doesn't sound like a great time, does it? Anyway, this tactic got him through his first few critical days after the escape, after which he put phase two into play. Mass made his way north uh, to the north coast of Singapore through a storm drain. It is like uh, Shawshank Redemption, where he inflated a makeshift pool float made from empty water bottles he had been saving up in the lead up as well, and he set out to sea, where he still floats around preaching jihadism to fishermen and cruise ships to this very day. No, of course not. He actually just used his plastic bottles to swim to Johor, Malaysia, which is directly connected to Singapore by a road bridge. I was like, oh my god, he swam to a different country. <laughs> But it's there's a bridge crossing it, so it's probably not super challenging. Also, he's he's appropriately motivated. Still, the total swim was over a kilometer. Jesus, that is a, okay. That's a long bridge. Bravo. Uh, let's not bravo terrorists, which definitely deserves a blue Peter badge, in my opinion. Oh my god, blue Peter badges! I haven't thought about in a long time. As a kid, one of the most desirable things was a blue Peter badge. Americans and whoever else from other countries probably has absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. But a blue Peter badge would get you all sorts of free cool stuff. And I actually had two of them because I'm a legend. <laughs> Not really. I mean, I did have two of them. I got one because there was a play we did at my school and Blue Peter came to like film the making of a play and they gave me a blue Peter badge because of it. And then I won a photography competition and they gave me a blue Peter badge for that as well. It was like epic. And I lost them both. <laughs> Oh, my parents were upset because then they had to pay for me to go to theme parks and, and stuff. <laughs> the city of Johor has its own issues with terrorism, and Mass was able to link up with the local terror cell to secure a spot in one of their safe houses, where he safely hung his hat for the next year. And that's the official story from the Singapore authorities today. But the Malaysian counter-terrorism police actually insist that Mass was aided by some family members along the way, including his brother and niece. We can't quite verify any of that, though, so let's just stick with a slightly more bizarre motorway bridge story shall we? The Recapture. So, what happened next? Is Matt Salamat still out there, plotting his next move? Is he in your neighborhood? Is he in my neighborhood? Oh, uh, it's extremely unlikely. <laughs> Is he behind me right now? Oh, God. Whenever that happens, whenever I'm watching a movie or anything like that, I still have to look behind me. I'm looking behind me right now, and I know he's not here. I know he's not. He's, like, converting to... What's going on, anyway? <laughs> no, no, let's calm down. Everything's fine. Let me wrap this up and put your mind at ease. The authorities continued their search throughout the following year. Interpol issued a worldwide alert for the suspect, and his face became known to border guards all across Asia and beyond. A couple of Singapore citizens even forked out a $1 million reward for any information leading to his capture. Surely Mas Salamat's wings were well and truly clipped with all that attention heaped on him. I, I don't know if this guy's going to get caught. I have a feeling he isn't. I mean, 
at this point, you've gone to another country, you've got to go somewhere where there's an ext- no extradition policy, although with a million dollars, I feel like someone could kidnap you for that and take you back and be like, yo, you're going here. And then just secretly informing on the, you know, telling them where he is and getting the million dollars. That's a lot of motivation. Regardless, from his new base in Johor, Mas Salamat and his accomplices were dreaming up fresh schemes for his big comeback. Namely, they planned to kidnap Singaporean Chinese people working in Johor and hold them ransom in exchange for the release of all their terrorist buddies back home. This is how you're going to get caught, committing more crimes. But he did, I guess he didn't get caught for the original. Anyway, thankfully, the plot never came to fruition thanks to the Singapore anti-terror squad's favorite play, Threats of Indefinite Detention. They picked up three ex-members of Mass's terror posse and took them in for questioning. Interrogating them led the police to a tiny village in the northwest of Johor called Kampung Tak... Ta- <sighs> Tawakal, maybe. I apologize. During a raid on the 1st of April 2009, ha ha ha, just a prank. <laughs> Authorities found a man who had eluded them for over 13 months and caused Singapore no end of humiliation on the world stage. Dude, yeah, as you deserve. Your prison seems to be a bit of a joke. <laughs> yeah, we keep our most dangerous prison. How did he escape? Oh, he, he climbed out of a window and then over a fence and escaped by swimming to another country. Come on, Singapore. Less focus on the gun, more focus on the terrorism. Around 40 officers from the Royal Malaysian Police descended upon the village of just 100 residents to kick down the door. They found Mass hiding in the basement of a house where an accomplice named Joha lived upstairs with his family. Mas Salamat had been living a deservedly miserable little existence there, hidden from the other villagers and not even leaving his hidey hole to pray. The villagers were oblivious to the terror kingpin living among them, but Jahar didn't quite have the same level of plausible deniability. He was arrested too, along with several others suspected of helping the escapee throughout his year on the run. And then, on the 24th of September 2010, Mas Salamat himself was finally sent back to resume his indefinite detention at Singaporean prison, where he still wanders around, preaching jihadism to drug runners and murderers to this very day. Good. I mean, he shouldn't be there on indefinite detention. He should be, be there after being convicted of being a terrible, horrible terrorist. And that's the end of the story of Singapore's most wanted criminal in recent memory. Well, it's probably the end. I mean, it's unlikely that all mass will be escaping any time soon, as the authorities are now far more strict when transporting prisoners around the detention centers. Shackles and chains now come as standard. Nine guards and officers got a good thrashing the last time it happened, so they're pretty darn determined to not become the laughingstock of the criminal justice world again anytime soon. So what can we take away from this story of penal mishaps and bizarre getaways? Well, if you frequented jihadist internet forums at the time... <laughs> definitely didn't first of all what the hell yes <laughs> what the hell and second you might have seen mass's fans bigging up his escape as divinely blessed yeah divine <laughs> god guided him through the window surely only god himself could have facilitated such a farce Callum and I, same page. In reality, though, you just have to have a brief look at the facts to see that it wasn't down to the will of God. This was just plain old human incompetence at work, allowing one of Asia, Asia's worst criminals to break out as easily as a wayward pensioner wandering out of their retirement home. Is that fact utterly terrifying, a bit hilarious, or perhaps a mix of both? I'll let you decide. Indeed, I think it is a mix of both, to be honest. <laughs> Because it's like, oh, it's terrifying that the, the terrible criminal escaped. If it was a jewel thief, we'd be like, ah, fine. But he's a terrible terrorist. This has been an episode. This has been a short episode of The Casual Criminalist. If you liked it and you're watching this on YouTube, smash that like button. Make sure you are subscribed because we have usually one episode a week, which is long and more brutal. And then we usually have one of these extra short ones, sort of a bit of a palate cleanse, like my idea for the Florida man at the uh in between maybe one or two a week we'll see how we do like i say i've been simon this was the casual criminalist and thank you for watching or listening if you're listening